First you separate, and then you integrate Just follow these steps, and you will do great First you separate, and then you integrate Just follow these steps, and you will do great First you separate, and then you integrate Just follow these steps, and you will do great Here's the season to be serving When I was solving equations, I was feeling amazing Greetings, pre-calculus students, and welcome to lesson two Let's see what we have in store for today all right, so lesson number two is all about function uh, definition. Definition, again, you've probably heard before in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. It's important to mention uh, the formal definition of a function, and we also will give some commentary on why uh, the particular aspect of a function is important. So for today's agenda, uh, we're going to first review, and we'll pretty much do that at the beginning of every lesson, uh, review the concepts that we covered in the previous lesson. That, so that's kind of a constant thing. We don't do it all the time, however, but most of the time we'll kind of do a review of, of the lesson from the day before. And so the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to review, and then we're going to look at the definition of a function, and we'll look at a vertical line test, and we'll look at piecewise functions. So that's kind of what we have for today. So let's go ahead and begin our review. So I have here a free fall scenario and it says a ball is dropped from a height of 330 meters above the ground. How high above the ground is the ball at six seconds? So I would like you to try this on your own before you watch me work out the problem. So please pause the video, try to work it out on your own and then unpause the video and you'll see me work the problem out. Okay, so okay, so the ball was dropped from a height of 330 meters. So that means a position function for this particular ball, uh, say I call the position function f of t. That means f of t is negative 5 t squared plus 330. Again, a position function for free for all uh, is pretty simple. It's going to be negative 5 t squared plus the initial height uh, when the units are in meters. So this wants me to find the height at time when t equals 6. So I'm just going to find f of 6. And f of 6 will be negative 5 times 6 squared plus 330. Uh, that's 36 times negative 5 is negative 180 plus 330, which is 150. So at time t equals 6, the ball will be 150 meters above the ground. So that's kind of how we do that. Let's also review evaluating functions. So we'll review evaluating functions uh, with numerical values and also algebraic expressions. So let's say I have a, a function, say this function h of x, and let's say it's 3x squared minus x plus 5, and let's say I want to find h of 10. So I'm just going to plug in 10 for x, uh, of course, and evaluate the function. Again, please try it on your own. I know this is simple, uh, but still, something you want to try on your own before you watch me do it. So pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you unpause the video, uh, you'll see me working it out. All right, so h of 10 would be 3 times 10 squared minus 10 uh, plus 5. So this is 10 squared. 100 times 3 is 300. This is negative 10 plus 5, so that's minus 5. So that's 290. Five. Uh, very simple again. And let's look at another evaluation. This time let's evaluate the function uh, with an algebraic expression. Again, we're just doing a review here. Uh, so let's say in this case, uh, the function is g of t. So let's say g of t is 2t squared plus t plus 8. So that's g of t. And let's say we want to find g of x plus h. All right, so this is a pretty good problem. So uh, once again, pause the video, try it on your own, 
unpause it and, and watch me work out and see if uh, me and you agree with the same answer. All right, so what I'm going to do is everywhere I see a T, I'm going to plug in X plus H. So this is 2 times X plus H squared plus X plus H plus H. So I need to square this first. So X plus H squared is X squared plus 2XH plus H squared here. It's really nothing, nothing. This X plus H here is nothing to distribute or anything like that. So this is just plus X plus H and plus H. So from here, we'll just distribute this two and then combine like terms. <clears throat> so this is 2X squared plus 4XH plus 2H squared. Again, that's plus X plus H plus 8. So now we'll combine our like terms. And actually, uh, we don't have any like terms. So there's only one x squared term, only one xh term, only one h squared term, only one x term, only one h term, only one uh, constant. So there is our answer. So now let's look into the definition of a function. So I'm just reading the definition here. So a function is a relation from the domain to the range where every element in the domain is assigned to exactly one element of the range. So a function is a special type of relation. You know, a relation is, is like a rule from one set to another set. Uh, we're calling the input set the domain and the output set the range and where every element of the domain is assigned exactly one element of a range. And so uh, that's the definition, again, you have heard before, going back at least to Algebra 1, uh, maybe even before that. And you might wonder, why is this particular definition important? Or why is a function such an important type of relation? And the issue is, uh, when simulating things, uh, when designing functions uh, to model things in real life, typically in real life, at a certain input, we're only looking for a certain output. Uh, when you're on your cell phone and you push a button, when you push that button, you want it to perform a particular operation. You don't want to push that button and not know what operation it's going to perform. So when you push a button on your cell phone, that's like the input. That's like the domain. What the cell phone does after that is like the output. It's like the range. And typically, when you put an input, you have a well-designed output. If a particular element in the, in the domain can have more than one element in the range assigned to it, when you put that input, you don't know what your output is going to be. Your output uh, could be multiple things. So the fact that on a function for every input, I get a unique to that input output, that's what uh, step separates functions uh, from other type of relations. And that is pretty important because what it does is it allows us to get uh, definite results for a particular input. It gives us a certain level of certainty for every particular input. Again, if there was multiple outputs for a particular input, then there's a certain sense of uncertainty. So that, that's one of the reasons why this definition, uh, this characteristic maybe I should say, of a function is so vitally important. Now, because really the main thing about a function compared to just a general relation is that each uh, element of the domain is paired with only one element of the range, that could be easily seen in a graphical standpoint. That could be easily tested, maybe it's better to say, uh, with a graphical representation and using, using something called the vertical line test. So let me explain this and why the vertical line test aligns with this definition of a function. So there I have a graph. And right now I'm not sure if it's a graph of a function or not. Uh, I'm gonna test to see. And again, based off the definition of a function, where every member of the domain, which in this case would be the values on the x-axis, is paired with exactly one 
particular value of the range, which would be the value on the y-axis, we can use something called a vertical line test to determine if a graph is that of a function or not of a function. Meaning if I draw any vertical line anywhere on the graph, and if it only hits the graph once, so any vertical line, if it only hits the graph once, that designates that that particular graph represents a function. Why? Because if a vertical line only hits the graph once, so let me choose a value. Say I'm hitting a graph right here. So let's say for the sake of argument, this is the value of the function when the x value is say one. If I only hit it once, that means that, that x value only has one value in the range, which our definition says. If I would happen to hit this graph more than once for any particular x value, so a vertical line going down the x value, if I hit the graph more than once, it means that x value has more than one value in the range violating the definition of a function. So that's why this is a real easy way to determine if a graph represents a function or not based off the definition. So this graph obviously is a function. Uh, let's look at another graph. So here's another graph. And if you look, if you just imagine drawing a vertical line, you'll see pretty much every vertical line you draw is gonna hit the graph twice, which means that this guy is not a function, so it violates the definition of a function. I mean, if you take any, any of these values, but I'll take uh, one as easy to see, say when x is two, when x is two, the function has two values. It has this value up here, where it looks like it's four, and it has this value down here, where it looks like it's negative four. So it has two values in the range assigned to one value in the domain and therefore uh, that cannot be a function. So that's how we do the vertical line test. Now let's look at piecewise functions. Okay, piecewise functions are pretty important and I'm gonna write one and then I'll explain kind of why they're important uh, when they're used in, in, in real life applications. So let me just first write a piecewise function and then kind of explain. So let me call this function f of x. And f of x uh, will have the following definitions. It's 3x minus one provided x is greater than or equal to four. And let's say it's x squared minus two provided x is less than. Four. So in mathematics, you know, uh, names, the nomenclature is very logical. So a function that we call a piecewise function is a function that consists of two or more pieces. So it can have any number of pieces from two to infinity. Um, for our course, the piecewise functions we're going to see for the most part are going to consist of two pieces. Every now and then we may sprinkle in a piecewise function that has three pieces, but for the vast majority of the time, our piecewise functions are gonna consist of two pieces. Now notice the two pieces, there's, there's conditions here. The, the function takes the value of this particular function for all values when x is greater than or equal to four, and it takes the value of this particular function when x is less than four. Why piecewise functions are necessary because there are situations in real life where a particular scenario can be modeled a certain way until it gets to a certain time or maybe a certain elevation or maybe a certain speed and then we now need a different function to model what's going on. Let's say we want to evaluate this piecewise function. So say I want to define f of, of six. Now the piecewise function has provisions here. 
So whenever you evaluate a piecewise function, you're only gonna evaluate it at one piece. I don't care how many pieces it have. This, this piecewise function can have 993 pieces. When I evaluate it, I'm only gonna use one piece. And it's the piece that the value I'm evaluating it fits in. So here I wanna find f of six. Well, where does f of six fit? Six is a number which is greater than or equal to four. So I'm gonna use the piece that says x is greater than or equal to four. That's it, I don't have to use both pieces. So f of six, even though this function consists of two pieces, the only piece that is relevant to six is the piece where x is greater than or equal to four. So f of six is simply three times six minus one. That's 18 minus one. That's 17. If I wanted to find f of negative one of the same particular function, again, I'm gonna look at which piece does negative one fit into. Well, negative one is a number which is less than four, so it's gonna fit into the piece which is less than four. So f of negative one would be negative one squared minus two. That's one minus two, that's negative one. So that is how you evaluate piecewise functions. Uh, sometimes people think you got to plug the number into both pieces. Uh, that's an incorrect assumption uh, because the pieces have provisions and therefore you only plug it into the piece where the number makes sense for that particular piece. Let's look at graphing uh, piecewise functions. So here's another piecewise function. I'm going to call it f of x again and say f of x is um, 2x minus 1 where x is less than 1 and it is x squared where x is greater than or equal one um well, that's interesting uh, th there's something that's, that would happen on this problem uh, that is a bit interesting the way it is is written now and i don't want that to happen it's, it's not good for my example so i'm going to change this minus one here to plus one there there is a reason why i, I want to make the change uh, the way i had the function uh, set up when it was minus one, it was like it was uh, continuous at x equals one, which is not something uh, that I want. So you, you may not know what I mean by that, but for those that do understand, then you can understand why I wanted to change that minus one to a plus one. So uh, my function is two x plus one, where x is less than one, and x squared, where x is greater, I didn't write x, where x is greater than or equal to one. So uh, we should know how to graph uh, linear equations, of course, and we should know how to graph quadratics. Uh, we should also know how to graph absolute value functions and, and, and some other things. But mainly for right now, we're going to be seeing you know, uh, linear and quadratic. So those are definitely things we know how to graph. So I'm going to graph this piecewise function. And let's say this is uh, one right here. So I'm going to come from the left. And from the left of one, there's gonna be this function two x plus one. So that's a linear equation that has a y-intercept at one. And I just need another point on this graph. So let's see uh, when x is negative one. So this is negative one right here for x. When x is negative one, this is at negative one. So negative one, negative one is a point on this line as well as zero one it's y intercept and when x is one it's three but that's not going to be that doesn't count when x is equal to one because this is only for values less than one so what's going to happen is you have this line and once it gets to one it stops because it only counts for values which are less than one and since it says less than one, not less than or equal to one, uh, there's gonna be an open circle there. And that's all that graph. Again, it doesn't go past one, so that's it. 
Now, for the values greater than or equal to one, uh, we're gonna use this x squared graph. Now, x squared, of course, is, is a parabola. So we know this, this graph looks something like this. And we know when x is equal to one, x squared value is one. So you, you'll have a point here at one comma one. Notice it's a closed circle because it's equal. It's or equal to one. So one is included in this guy. And then from there, you just continue the parabola. So the graph of this particular piecewise function uh, will look uh, something uh, like this. Again, notice the open circle on this piece because it said less than one, not less than or equal to, and notice the closed circle on this piece because it says greater than or equal to one. Let's look at another graph of another piecewise function. I'm gonna say h of x. is x squared minus one for x uh, not equal to say three and and two x when x is equal to three. Alright so you notice for this particular piecewise functions this particular piecewise function uh, we have not equals an equal sign versus less than a greater than sign. Now, a lot of people, when they see, and initially, when they see a piecewise function like this, they think that the most important piece is this 2x piece because it says where x is equal to 3. But that's the most insignificant piece. The most significant piece of this graph of this function is the x squared minus 1. Why? because this is for all values that are not equal to three. There's an infinite number of numbers that are not equal to three. There is only one number that is equal to three. So the two X only accounts for one X value, three. That's it, three. No more, no less. X squared minus one accounts for every other X value. So this is by far uh, the most important and prevalent part of this particular function. So let's look at the graph. Here's the graph. One, two, three. And so let's see the value of this function when x is three is eight. So let's, let's just uh, say that this eight up here and the value of this function when x is three is six. So let's say that this is six right there. All right, so this is x squared minus one is my main function because it's gonna represent all points except for when x is three. And that's just a parabola. It has a vertex at negative one. Let's say that's negative one. And so let's draw that parabola. And when x is three, it's gonna be at eight. So there's three there. Now it doesn't stop, however, because once x is greater than three, I go back to this function. It's only when x equals three that I don't use this function. So it continues. The, that parabola continues on. But now when x is equal to three, I'm using this function. When I plug in three to this function, I get six. So I'll put a closed circle there at six. And that's the graph of that particular piecewise function. All right, uh, we're gonna stop there. So we looked at the definition of a function, uh, which was nothing new. We looked at the vertical line test, which was nothing new. And what may have been new to you was the introduction of these piecewise functions. And you wanna be able to evaluate a piecewise function, choose the appropriate piece to plug the number in, and you want to be able to graph a piecewise function. So I'm hoping you can do both of those operations for piecewise functions. And like always, we'll see you next time.
When I was solving equations, I was feeling amazing Problem after problem, until the day's end Solving, keep solving, and turn the page in And still keep grinding, solutions keep finding I have never seen a problem like this But I know exactly where it fits First order, separable, ODEs Now I know what to do, holy me First you separate, and then you integrate